all good afternoon good evening or even good morning depending on uh, which part of the world you are uh, listening this talk from and no it does not get old i still want to give a huge shout out to the crypto village organizing community for uh, making this virtual con happen for us uh welcome to the second talk of the day from my side uh in this talk i'm going to touch base upon how to store uh, infra sensitive information securely so that uh, we can safeguard it uh, reasonably well against any kinds of uh, offline cracking attempts and before we go ahead i'd like to introduce myself i'm uh, mansi sheth i work as a security researcher at a leading static analysis company called uh, veracode uh my primary responsibility here is to be on top of the latest and greatest happenings in the security field uh, more specifically in the application security domain and uh, transfer that knowledge to make sure our customers are uh, safe uh i'm a huge crypto enthusiast i have spent a lot of time uh, or actually the reasonable amount of time um uh, understanding different uh, base crypto blocks uh its practical implementations how it can be used in uh, real world i understand a lot of anti patterns i've spent a lot of time uh, looking at different uh, crypto implementations across uh, programming languages and i try to translate all this uh, expertise into uh, making sure our customers code bases are safe and to help pick up any anti patterns uh recently i uh, got thinking uh, why are we seeing so many uh, data breaches in the first place uh eventually i realized okay this is going to be a matter of uh, when rather than if so what can we do to protect this information once it is already breached uh, mainly from any kind of uh, offline cracking how can we uh, make the information cracking process very very expensive that it is almost useless so in that quest first uh, first place i'll definitely go or for that matter of which first thing comes to uh, anyone's mind would would be our try hunts uh, most organized most informative uh, site about this called uh, have i been pawned uh in this site he keeps a database of uh, all the breaches which has happened in um, probably last decade uh and it uh, gives out information about uh, what might have happened what has happened and all those kind of uh, neat stuff so instead of uh, putting a big slide of uh, shame kind of thing like who got hacked and what were the reasons and stuff uh, what i tried to do was uh, look at all the domains which were hacked and what kind of mechanism were they using for uh, storing any kind of sensitive information uh so this is what i this is what my analysis says uh there were around 453 unique domains uh, 13% was storing it in plain text 20% as uh, hashes without any salting 30% as salted hash around 15% still using a uh, key derivation for uh, key derivative functions which is a great step and uh, roughly 23% uh, decided not to disclose which in my opinion is plain text but no judgments here uh so uh like looking at it i was thinking okay why were they breached in the first place most of the times it was because they did not pay a lot of attention in uh, other kinds of security issues in their applications uh, a lot of them were uh, simple sql injections where the entire databases were uh, dumped out um open s3 buckets was not a uncommon thing i saw there were a lot of uh, unprotected uh, endpoints uh, which kind of uh, leaked this data uh so that was my first lesson learned that uh, why are these things happening uh and now uh, then mainly my focus was towards uh, thinking about okay this breach has already happened or this breaches are always going to keep happening for even for innocent reasons sometimes well there is nothing innocent about security uh so my next thing was okay now what can what happens after this breaches uh, are done and my first thought was like oh wow the modern computer architecture is getting cheaper and cheaper and it's going to keep getting cheaper from uh, now on 
all this modern gpus with uh, extremely high uh, parallelization capabilities can crack this things in minutes and uh, making the cost much more making the password cost uh, much cheaper to uh, for any kind of offline uh, mechanisms uh, there are, with the uh, with the whole uh, bitcoin mining uh, philosophy of uh, cracking there are so many uh, asics uh, application uh, sorry application uh, specific integrated uh, integrated circuits out there which makes the cost of cracking much more cheaper uh, there are literally uh, trillions of uh, hashes happening within seconds and this can be easily mapped to any kind of crypto primitives uh, all these things are going to keep making password cracking much more uh, cheaper with time so what should we do well the need of the hour was always uh, stretching this information out so that it takes uh, we have to throw a lot of computational uh, resources like cpu and uh, memory to compute each password with that we are going to increase the speed with which the passwords are being calculated uh, this will greatly increase the offline cracking time uh, and making us uh, resilient towards any kind of uh, modern computer architectures or brute forcing or any kind of uh, uh, time memory trade off attacks or uh, uh, rainbow tables dictionary attacks all those kind of things so that's what uh, we really needed and uh, how did we achieve that is uh, using uh, key derivation functions well there this concept of key derivation function isn't uh, specific to password uh, hashing or secret information hashing uh, in fact, it came into existence for actually creating key material out of uh, low entropy inputs. Uh, but at that time, when uh, everyone were in this uh, cat and mouse race, uh, people thought that, okay, uh, KDFs are much better suited than just simply storing things as uh, plain hashed or uh, salted hashes. It, it can be much better safeguarded at that time. Uh, so... And thus, this whole philosophy of using uh, key derivation functions, uh, KDFs, uh, came into picture. So, uh, simply how this works. Uh, well, underlying, there is still an uh, algorithm which is used, which is uh, iterated uh, hundreds and thousands and sometimes a couple of millions of times on a basic crypto primitive. Uh, this, are, this type of functions are called uh, adaptive functions. Uh, and then much more uh, matured ones are throwing a, lit a little or sometimes a lot of memory to this iterative process, uh, which increases or uh, almost uh, quadruples the speed of uh, cracking offline. And still uh, it takes password and salt, uh, gives out a fixed length uh, hash. And it's the work factor which, is, uh, which can be tuned based on uh, different hardware your application is being uh, deployed. Uh, so that's going to be the base of uh, our talk today to protect or safeguard against uh, most of the offline cracking mechanisms. Uh, some uh, design considerations I'd like to point out here is uh, try to save your uh, password hash and salt in completely different databases like uh, or a distributed database or like maybe a database and a property file or something. They should not be close to each other. Uh, Obviously, you're not going to store a password in plain text anymore. Uh, I can even go as far as saying that uh, maybe we can have different works, work factors for uh, different uh, information we are trying to uh, safeguard or even like different logins can have different uh, work factors and storing uh, work factor per login, obviously. Uh, with increasing cost in uh, memory or uh, CPU, uh, uh, it should be routinely checked that uh, work factors are uh, incremented accordingly to keep uh, making password offline cracking expensive. Uh, lastly, how expensive should be uh, is tolerable or acceptable? Uh, industry standards are uh, any kind of interactive login, a latency of around one second is, is, is very acceptable. So make sure uh, you tune your work factors in a way that the output is calculated around a second. This is a uh, acceptable latency and it still increases the offline cracking time by a huge margin. 
and uh, lastly if you are using your uh, password or trying to save a password which is not going to be involved in uh, interactive logins like for example your uh, hard disk encryption a latency of around uh, 5 to 6 seconds is quite acceptable in uh, that scenario so those are the things i like to uh, say about uh, key derivation functions uh, in general uh, let's start talking about uh, different uh, key, uh, key derivation functions in uh, existence, uh, starting with uh, adaptive functions. Uh, one of the oldest and the most widely adopted function was uh, PBKDF2. Again, it came into picture because uh, they really needed to generate keying materials. Uh, this function uh, is the only government approved function right now so if you really have to comply by government standards i really wish you don't then this is probably your uh, only option unfortunately uh, this function is also used as a different crypto primitive blocks for uh, other functions uh, other modern uh, functions uh, in these days uh, let's see how this actually works internally so just like our uh, generic kdf uh, working uh, it still takes a password assault gives out a password hash uh, you can actually configure the size you expect out of a password hash this feature was more for uh, uh, because there is always requirement of a fixed key size for any kind of uh, block cipher being used for the work factor is in terms of uh, iteration count mm. Let's talk a little bit about the internal working of this algorithm. Uh, what it does is it runs uh, the crypto prim primitive it iterates over is called a pseudo random function, usually a uh, HMAC. Uh, based on the desired output length and the block size of the internal hash being used in the HMAC, uh, different blocks are generated and those blocks are iterated for the iteration number of counts times. Output is concatenated and that's your uh, password hash. Uh, so you will see things a little bit in a uh, green color here. What I have done is uh, I have written a tool which will do parameter tuning for me based on the uh, rules of thumb I uh, mentioned earlier about having a password being calculated in roughly one second for uh, interactive logins and roughly five seconds for any kind of uh, non-interactive logins. So since uh, PBKDF is a uh, government approved, they say the iteration count or the work factor for uh, this algorithm should be around 10,000, which is way lower. And please don't do that. Please increase something. Uh, for for a reasonable hardware on which most of the typical web applications are would be deployed in uh, today's time, uh, EC2 T2 instance with uh, roughly 8 GB of uh, RAM and uh, x86 architecture, I ran this tool and the uh, and number of iterations were around uh, 1.5 million for just one second of password calculation. Just imagine how off uh, the government standards are here. So uh, I'll highly motivate whichever algorithm you decide to use among all the th algorithms you're going to talk about. Please uh, run some kind of a tuning uh, utility. Play around with your parameters. Uh, I'll be open sourcing this tool anyways. You can feel free to uh, grab it and run it on your deployment hardware to tune your uh, work factor accordingly. Uh, some things you should be worried about when uh, choosing this algorithm is uh, please choose your password output uh, length little less than or equal to the internal hash you are using. The reason being uh, it unnecessarily takes a lot of uh, processing power for uh, no value add. So that's one of my uh, suggestion. Uh, in this, uh, in this work, in this algorithm, you can just uh, configure the CPU time involved. Uh, there is no memory involved. It is still not at all resilient towards any kinds of uh, brute forcing attempts because of the highly parallelized nature of uh, very very cheaply uh, rentable uh, GPUs in today's time. If you don't have to comply by with the government standards. Please move on, use some better uh, memory hard functions. Uh, next uh, notable mention, uh, Bcrypt, uh, still one of the, one of, uh, it's very commonly used. Uh, it is based on a uh, already deprecated uh, symmetric, symmetric cipher called uh, Blowfish. Uh, 
it involves a little bit of a memory for its internal working so that's what is slightly better than pbkdf but again that memory or amount of memory it will need or use is uh, not tunable by uh, by the user and again it was designed for uh, generating key materials and not with uh, storing se- secrets or password hashing in mind so how does this algorithm work internally again we have a password a uh, fixed size salt a password uh, uh, output as a password hash uh, iteration count is uh, specified in uh, logarithmic way so this is going to be 2 raised to 14 number of iterations and internally how it works is it has this very expensive uh, blow, blow cipher based uh, f- blow cipher uh, key setup process which involves some memory so it iterates uh, around that key setup and the output is uh, again iterated through a normal uh, blow cipher uh, blowfish algorithm and the output is uh, given to the caller um it still is a little better than pbkdf because of the internal ram usage but it is it is still very susceptible to brute forcing attacks maybe a slightly more expensive than the previous one and i don't understand why to use bcrypt though i have seen a lot of usages of that uh, if you don't have to even co- comply by the government standards why not use uh, the more uh, modern um, memory hard functions okay let's start talking about a uh, few different uh, memory hard functions uh the first one being uh, script uh it's one of the very earlier generation memory hard uh, memory hardness built inside the function uh it's ha- it is having a increased adoption in uh, cryptocurrencies mainly due to the nature of it in cryptocurrencies they don't really need to worry about uh, time memory trade off attacks like uh, offline cracking needs to and uh, Uh, cryptocurrencies needs to be more worried about side channel attacks which is not the domain for uh, offline cracking so it's mainly due to the nature of the applications it's widely adopted in cryptocurrencies it's not like uh, it's better or uh, less less secure for other applications uh, it was still designed uh, for uh, keying material but it, it saw a lot of uh, promising uh, breakthroughs in you in being used for uh, offline cracking okay let's see how this works it uh, still has password salt uh, output password we are given uh, we can still configure the length we desire out of the output and if you see the work factor has increased from 1 to almost 3 at this point and not all are uh, going to be uh, still giving us all the freedom to tune all kinds of resources but that's a huge step in the right direction in my opinion with memory hardness involved uh there is parallelization you can parallelize the computation uh i would like to note here that not all uh, implementations uh, give this control to the user they still do it the way uh, it depends on the implementation uh you would note that there is only uh, one parameter which will control both the cpu resources as well as the memory involved basically it does not differentiate be- between it, uh, between both the resources we can throw at this algorithm uh, so basically going down the line if uh, we decide that memory is getting cheaper so we should increase the amount of memory being used in the algorithm we don't really have a choice here and finally is the block size which is used internally uh most typical values are 8 or 16 does not make a huge difference so that's okay uh let's talk a little bit about how the algorithm works internally uh as we were talking about in uh, while talking about pp uh, pbkdf uh it is used internally from mac to generate a fixed size password uh, which is looped through this uh, crazy memory uh, array with a lot of uh, string ciphers and xoring going on for the iteration number of count uh and again the output is uh, made a fixed size by uh, pbkdfing it again and the uh, output is passed to the caller uh if you are choosing this uh well this reduces uh, the time uh, any kind of brute, uh, brute forcing uh, attempts by a huge margin compared to adaptive functions but 
the way the memory is being used by the algorithm internally it is still using adjusted adjacent uh, memory arrays in the consecutive operations what i'm trying to say is depending on the value of the password the consecutive arrays are chosen so this is always going to be a predefined uh, sequence of memory arrays based on the input password and what this opens us is uh, towards the side channel uh, side, uh, side channel attacks uh, again as we spoke about earlier there is no way we can tune the cpu and memories uh, independently and since there is a lot of crypto involved in uh, this algorithm like we saw we have hmac we have pbkdf we have uh, salsa stream ciphers we have uh, exoring we next again have pbkdf number of crypto involved uh, increases the implementations become more complicated more error prone the crypto analysis becomes more complicated and it's it's not as sleek basically so uh so these are the things uh, you should think about if you decide to go with a script still a huge step ahead of the adaptive functions it still reduces the offline cracking cost by a huge margin almost like a quadruple based on the number of iterations uh it's a great choice well don't they say save the best algorithm for the last and that's what argon 2 is uh around uh, 2015 there was this uh, competition which uh, took place and the goal of that competition was to uh, come out with an algorithm which is specifically suited for uh, storing secrets and safeguard it against any kind of uh, offline cracking obviously uh, it wasn't like before the, that uh, no one was thinking about uh, how to safely store information uh, well the breaches were happening it was more like a cat and mouse race and uh, and the industry started looking at okay what current uh, tools are there in the uh, in the cryptography arsenal which we can apply to this particular problem quickly so that uh, they can safeguard their their information as long as they can from uh, any kind of uh, off- offline cracking mechanism uh well argon 2 uh, the winner of this algorithm is uh, obviously going to take care of all those existing attacks we are uh, we have been talking about so far it's uh, very resilient against uh, uh, against any brute forcing or a dictionary attack it's very hard to just parallelize it and uh, run uh, computations and uh, start cracking passwords in minutes uh they were also very resilient about the modern computer ar- architecture which uh, which started maturing become much cheaper and they were very very cognizant about it will keep getting cheaper with time so it's obviously going to be uh, it's very uh, resilient against any uh, application specific uh, integrated circuit architectures or even fpga arrays uh well few years ago there were limited implementations of this algorithm uh, out of a direct cryptographic uh, library but that situation has uh, greatly changed so congratulations you don't have to implement this uh, algorithm yourself you can pick up any programming language any library in that language and for the, and for the most uh, most of the t- most uh, amount of time you would be having this implementation uh, ready to be plugged and played in your uh, application so let's see how this algorithm works uh, well you still have your passwords and salts you still have will get a fixed length uh, hashed password in terms of uh, memory factors you have a uh, three parameters now one is obviously parallelization you can configure it based on number of uh, cpu cores you have at your uh, disposal and you can tune the amount of cpu needed uh, in terms of number of iterations and uh, the memory which can be used in this algorithm uh in terms of uh, memory size so it basically decouples both the resources uh, resource utilizations very unlike a uh, script and uh, one of the huge uh, advantages uh well there is some crypto analysis done on uh, argon 2 uh, algorithms which uh, makes any uh, iterations below 10 a little uh, susceptible but it is more uh, theoretical crypto analysis so don't freak out but choose a parameter which is at least greater than 10 and that's the reason uh, talking about uh, modes of operation uh, which is uh, crucial uh, 
there are two main types of uh, modes in this algorithm uh, one is data dependent mode which is uh, what was there in the previous script algorithm as well and a data independent mode which is the best option for uh, password storage and the third one is a hybrid of uh, both the modes uh, working together uh, how this modes work for that let's start talking about uh, the internal uh, crypto of this algorithm so how it goes is uh, it first uh, uh, computes a hash of uh, password salt and all this uh, different parameters uh, any hash can be used uh, usually it is a uh, blake 2 and based on the value of the hash the uh, sorry before that there is this uh, memory array which is uh, dedicated to this based on the memory size we give so just imagine it as rows and columns being populated iteratively for a number of iterations of uh, times now after uh, so for data dependent mode and data independent mode how it is different it's like each memory array is being uh, populated in sequence but that sequence in data dependent mode is decided by the value of the hash which is de dependent on the value of the input password and for data independent mode it is completely random so uh, so basically what it comes down to is the sequence of uh, memory array population per iteration is actually based on the input password and this particular feature of this algorithm makes it uh, susceptible to uh, side channel at attacks which is okay for uh, cryptocurrencies but not very uh, comfortable for any kind of uh, password storage and that's why you should use uh, the independent mode where the the sequence of memory or a population is completely random and it takes away even that issue which uh, a script had and uh, which even the this kind of attacks might have so some design considerations uh, you have to uh, tune your parameters a little uh, more carefully and mostly because you have few more parameters to uh, take care of um, as we talked about the data independent mode is uh, more susceptible to any kind of uh, side channel attacks and uh, there is this hybrid mode where uh, the first part of it is happening in independent ma manner and the next half is happening in the data dependent manner and with that we get the best of both worlds we are susceptible we are uh, resilient towards side channel attacks as well as we are much better with the time tra memory trade off issues so uh, that's what uh, i would say uh, use argon 2 uh, mainly in 2id mode uh, we already looked at what is the best parameter options for an output for a password computation within a second since argon 2 is the algorithm i am uh, highly recommending to be used for uh, any kind of uh, sensitive information storage i like to quickly show how easy it is to just start using this uh, by any uh, implementations you have access to uh, i just to record this demo i had a fork of a ec2 instance uh, these are the details of the instance it's a typical standard uh, t2 medium with uh, two cpus and uh, 4gb of uh, ram currently available as, as of this moment is around 2.8 gigs uh, it's using a x86 architecture on a linux kernel so let's see how quickly it is to start using this well i uh, i'm going to use nacl's uh, password uh, module where the argon2 id is being supported well a quick uh, pro tip whenever given a choice of uh, any any crypto uh, implementation you uh, you need if you have a choice always go for nacl it's uh, very cleanly written written by cryptographers rather than actual developers they uh, deprecate uh, things which are no more secure or uh, better options are available out there they quickly deprecate all those things from anyone's view so chances of uh, making wrong choices are uh, eliminated okay coming back to the code uh, we are going to use that module and just to keep track of time we are going to use the time module uh, start time is going to be uh, current time let's start storing the password uh, first let's use the module hash dot argon to id 
why not use the hybrid one best of both worlds right uh, and the string output for that uh, giving the password a long is uh, better than a higher entropy shorter one so that's what i choose for uh, ops limit is the number of iterations around the memory array let's go for 14 uh, and it's uh, around till 10 is already uh, theoretically crypto analyzed so anything about 10, 10 is great uh, and the key thing memory it's again logarithmically given um, we already know the answer from our uh, tuning tool so let's see this is this is as short and sweet as it can get actually and uh, just to keep track of time let's see how much it is and hopefully this compiles and runs actually okay uh, so it took around uh, 1.1 second uh, can we go any higher let's see going from 27 to 28 which is uh, 2.3 uh, I'll leave that choice to you at this point uh, this is how you should uh, typically uh, tune any parameters It's almost a second nature to wonder how these functions actually compare against each other. Uh, there is not a lot of uh, research done in uh, this uh, topic about how to actually uh, put a dollar value or number of years of cracking a particular uh, breach mechanism or uh, there is no apples to orange comparison as well, uh, you could imagine. But uh, good notable work is being done by uh, the, these two papers, uh, one released in uh, Usenix uh, a couple of years ago and uh, another one done in uh, conjunction at uh, between Microsoft and uh, Purdue University. Uh, in the most trivial way, what they do is uh, they, uh, they look at the latest hardware and the memory cost and uh, just uh, do a reverse or uh, just start calculations from there. Uh, and that's what I tried to do it as of yesterday. Uh, so for adaptive functions, it's just going to be, uh, again, uh, sorry, again, a huge uh, list of disclaimers here before I actually talk about this very, very cautiously actually, is uh, the, I'm assuming the keyword, the password, the salt, the output, uh, all those uh, things are uh, same across all these functions. I'm also assuming there is no electricity cost involved. Um, yeah. And uh, so talking about these figures for adaptive functions, it's just going to be as simple as number of iterations per uh, cost of hardware. And the cost of uh, hardware would be uh, is much easier to calculate these days because most of the modern uh, ASICs hardwares for uh, Bitcoin mining come with that statistics. So looking at uh, one of the most uh, leading uh, hardware in that department coming from uh, Antminer, uh, there, uh, one of the best uh, configured one is around uh, $2,500 and it promises to do 110 trillion hashes per second. And trillion is 10 raised to 12 if you are uh, wondering as I was. Uh, so using that, uh, that configuration with the number of iterations, adaptive function is going to take so much time. The point being, it's going to be extremely cheap to just crack these passwords uh, considering this uh, decently priced machines are going to be in uh, common people's hand very soon. And uh, similarly for memory hard functions, and I want to stress here that this is only for uh, memory hard functions, which is running in the data dependent mode, where the uh, array used for uh, memory, uh, memory calculations is based on the input password. So where again, the cost is going to be uh, more based on uh, memory as well as uh, the amount of time it takes which pretty much quadruples in uh, memory hardness is going to be much more expensive compared to uh, adaptive functions and this is just for data dependent mode for data independent mode well the cost might still be the same but the number of guesses is going to be exponential so uh, this is just uh, sharing some uh, statistics still in a more uh, conservative tone uh, uh, this is all I've, what I wanted to speak about today uh, around uh, 
often cracking uh, different uh, mechanisms we can use to safeguard ourselves uh, key derivation function being the key of that or uh, how to tune different parameters uh, and uh, what kind of design considerations you should be doing while uh, picking each one of that uh, next, I'd like to uh, talk about a little bit about uh, how all this information can be mapped to storing any kind of secrets you uh, need to. Uh, for that, you need to sit down and do a little bit of uh, threat modeling for your own uh, usages. Uh, something like, uh, what what is sensitive to your business? Uh, do you need to comply by any uh, GDPR requirements or uh, are you storing any personally identified information? Uh, can it be uh, used for crafting further attacks against the uh, users whose inf whose information is uh, might be breached? Um, how are you storing that information? Are you storing it in a database? Which fields are involved in that database? All those things need to be uh, sort of thought about and you can easily map uh, all this uh, KDFs to work for your own uh, needs. Lastly, uh, you must have come across countless uh, countless uh, suggestions and uh, password hygiene uh, requirements or, or tips uh, over years since it is such a key aspect of any kind of uh, authentication mechanism uh, i let just for the complete completeness of this talk i like to say a few things about it uh, always choose a unique password uh, password managers are great please uh, use those uh, longer passwords are uh, better than uh, shorter higher entropy ones uh, this is what i typically do is uh, i store my uh, passwords in a password manager uh, this is the configuration i use while generating any new password i choose a longer password and with a reasonable amount of entropy uh, the point i'm trying to make is uh, there is a lot of crypto analysis done where uh, which points us towards the uh, points us towards the theory that longer passwords are uh, better than shorter ones with higher entropy. So, a password whose length is like say twenty five or thirty characters is far better than a password which is of uh, eight or ten characters uh, standard length with like two special characters, one uppercase and two digits and those kind of things. So do that and uh, the. The website we looked at about uh, about the data breached information, uh, they have a nice API uh, exposed by, again, Troy Hunt. Uh, it would be great to use that API in your websites or even password managers can start using that where uh, if a, used, a password which has already been seen in a breach is being used, then they would be flagged and uh, and that would go a long way. Uh, finally, in conclusion, uh, please embrace uh, adaptive uh, key derivation functions. Uh, use memory hard functions based on your choice and uh, comfort level with the amount of uh, crypto analysis done. Please don't do uh, plain text or hashing or your own DIY designs. Those are all uh, silly things in today's time. Uh, consider upgrading your work factors based on the resources uh, cost out in the market. Uh, consider having a unique work factors per uh, information you are trying to save or per uh, for each different user as well uh, password hygiene suggestion longer is better uh, than a shorter with a higher entropy uh, keep unique passwords uh, keep auditing your passwords for uh, its existence in any uh, breaches uh, and finally, I'd like to conclude uh, a huge thanks for uh, giving me this opportunity to uh, share my thoughts. My DMs are uh, always open for any interesting conversations. I blog a lot about these things in much more detail than what a 45-minute slot is going to ever allow me to. And finally, you will uh, find uh, all this uh, algorithms implemented in Java as well as the uh, tuning tool uh, on my uh, github repo thank you
Uh, that was talk how to store sensitive information in 2020 and do's, don'ts, and how to's of crypto building blocks using Java. Thank you again to Monsi. Uh, we have them right here for a live Q&A, so please put your questions in the Discord CPV Q&A channel. Uh, so just to start off, uh, what's the reason uh, for high memory usage is a requirement for KDFs? Uh, this is from Discord, by the way. I understand it helps make implementing A6 harder, but I don't understand why. Uh, sure. Uh, so A6, in my opinion, really started uh, coming into existence because of the underlying uh, bit mining uh, philosophy is uh, like uh, increasing the computation over and over again much much faster uh, the exp the hardware is still very uh, is still expensive and uh, throwing memory at it will just make uh, it much more expensive for um, a widespread uh, adoption actually and uh, that would ultimately add to the cost of uh, cracking passwords offline in my opinion um, Again, we have not seen the future. We don't know what quantum is going to get us, but uh, for foreseeable future, for whatever the current uh, theoretical crypto analysis says, uh, that's what it is. Awesome. Uh, we have another question. Uh, when memory is the bottleneck, is there still an advantage to using ASICs or does it revert to only negligible gain over general purpose CPUs? Uh, well, we still have a huge uh, iteration factor, right? So it's a combination of both. So uh, a general purpose CPU uh, can't be that highly paralyzed with the amount of memory required for each thread. So, yeah. Cool. Another question that we have is, uh, does a salt need to be just unique instead of being that big to avoid having two passwords hash the same thing? This is in relation to 64 bits versus, say, 128 bits. Uh, sure. Uh, well, 62, 64 bits is like the pure minimum requirement anyways uh, from a standard which was written like at least half a dozen, I mean, at least what, five or six years ago. I don't uh, remember right now. Actually, even more, this is PBKDF uh, probably. So, uh, I mean, uh, a little bit more salt, 128 is not unacceptable. It's not going to add hugely to the processing power. Uh, yeah, it's not a hard requirement, even a... Uh, CSPRNG is like maybe a little uh, too much crypto kind of a situation. Uh, so yeah, it's it's a little bit on a higher side, but uh, that's okay in my opinion. Right? It does not add to the computation at all. Awesome. Uh, another question we have, uh, and there were some side parts to this, of course, in chat if you want to go further into them, as I saw. But the question was, any thoughts on using Libsodium, the fork, instead of NACL? I have had great experiences with it. Uh, yeah, Lipsodium is great. It is being uh, adopted much more widely as I uh, stood corrected. NSEL is uh, last maintained like uh, at least uh, five, six years ago. I have a slight preference for NSEL just because I like the documentation and the names of the APIs and the way the ease, ease with which they are taking away all the all the like more options you give, the, high, the higher the chances of it actually going wrong. So uh, that way I feel NACL is slightly better, but Lipsodium is absolutely great anyways. So that's my personal preference, but yeah. Awesome. Uh, does anyone have any other QA questions? Please drop them into the Discord now. This is in the CPB Talk Q&A text channel. And we just wait for a little bit. Also, thank you so much for your talks. These are thank really you. lovely and I'm really excited for the next one to be replayed again soon. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. I'm having a lot of fun uh, watching me talk for two hours, so. <laughs> <laughs> oh man, that's a lot of anxiety <laughs> for me at least. Uh, that's fun. I think we have someone typing. Oh, nope, just. People love your talk. Thank you. Okay, let's see. Let's see if this last person has a question. All right. Uh, thank you again, Monsi, for all of your time with us. Uh, we hope you take care. Enjoy the rest of Crypto Village and DEF CON. Uh, we will love to see you in our Discord soon. Yep. Uh, please stay safe, everyone. Please stay safe. <laughs> thank you. Bye-bye. Awesome.